Take your Bibles to John chapter 8 from our scripture reading earlier. John chapter 8. We gather in this specific context to make sure we believe. This morning the question is, do you believe? I had a friend say it this way. In the American church, we have a lot of churched people. We might not have as many believers as we think. The church can sometimes do a really good job of churching you, but that will not save you. It will not give you eternal life. This is the question. Will you have the tragedy? Will you have the tragedy? Okay, A tragedy is a sad situation, especially one involving death. One of the greatest tragedies recorded in human history at its most damaging to life is World War II. Eighty million lives lost around the globe. Countless others impacted for the rest of their lives. Eighty million that died and those that lived did not live as well as they potentially could have because of war. We have war movies. I enjoy watching war movies. The more accurate the depiction, the more anxious I get. In certain movies, you see the training, and they go through the bonding, and they're uniting together, and they're coming together as a team. Then they're on the ship. You can start to see in the good actors there that anticipation of like, uh-oh. Then they get in the little boat, and they go to the beach. And as an accurate depiction, some gave their lives right then. Another series, another movie talks about those who jumped out of planes. Training, they're gathering, they're getting together, they're working hard, they get in those planes. Some jump out to battle, some die in the planes. Those who lived through it carried that. Those of you that are veterans who have seen active duty, I commend you, I would pray for you, because what you've seen is what I can only see from a depiction of someone saying cut, right? I get it, but the real thing that people have lived through is a tragedy. When we talk about a tragedy of death, the physical death from this life, that's a tragedy. But we're going a step further in what Jesus is going to be saying this morning. We're talking about the tragedy. The tragedy would be referred to in Scripture as the second death. Physically, we will all die unless Christ returns. And if and when that happens, we will be caught up with him. We may not face death. We will be brought up in the air with him. Until that day, each of us are in the hands of God. Our days are numbered. That the fullness of them is in God's hands. Revelation 21.8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 2, 11, at the very beginning of Revelation, and this is my call to you this morning. If you sit here this morning and you're kind of like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm saved because I've been here a lot. I'm pretty sure I'm saved because I'm a good person. I'm pretty sure I'm saved because I know all the answers. Listen, I'm going to go sometime later uh, in the training at Lamoca. Greg called and said, hey, would you mind teaching our counselors and our staff how to get to the gospel with the campers? I said, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. I get to make a class. It's going to be a really long class. I need to break up, do some examples. And you know what the most difficult kid to deal with as a counselor? And you might think, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know that kid, right? You can't find him half the time, running away all the time, arguing about everything all the time, rebellious, horrible, right? Those are the easy ones to work with. It's the kids that have all the right answers. It's the ones that know it but have never truly believed. Revelation 2, 11 says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. The second death. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. 
And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The second death is exclusively for those who have rejected Christ. It is not a place that if you're a believer today, you should have any fear of. It is not a place for you. But if by your own righteousness, if by your own works, if by the way you're living testify otherwise, you need to hear this morning. There is a place that will be worse. There is a day coming where your sins will be paid for by you for eternity. The Bible's clear, and it's called the second death. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. A complete and total separation from God. Some people are living their lives as if there is no God, and one day they will exist without his care. They will exist without his common grace. They will exist in torment. The church is weak today when we give the gospel like a car salesman, okay? I recently bought a vehicle, and what do they tell you? Oh, oh yeah, oh, oh, here's what you need this. You know what it'll do for you? You know how to change? You know this? And, oh, you don't like this one? Okay, let's try another one. Go to another dealer. What do they tell you? Oh, yeah, they got garbage over there. We got what you need over here. Our cars are this and our trucks are that. Okay, I'll get that one. Oh, no, go to another one. What do they do? They're trying to sell you on something. You're not selling anybody on the gospel. You really need Jesus in your life, it'll uh, make your paychecks feel better. You really need Jesus in your life so that you have someone to turn to when you don't know what to do. You really need Jesus so that you'll be at peace with yourself. No, you need Jesus because he's the only way to make you as an individual right in your walk and in your relationship with the God of the universe. He is holy and he will have no sin in his presence. You're a sinner. How, it, how is your sin paid for? By what Jesus did on the cross. And through your faith, you believing, you calling on his name, you, not your parents, not your church leaders, not your Sunday school teacher, no one else, you, you came to faith, you believed the gospel, you called on his name, you're born again, your name is written in the book of life. Because if your name is not written in the book of life, the second death is coming for you. You will die in this life. You will be in hell. One day hell will be cast into the lake of fire. It will be destroyed along with you. But you will not cease to exist. Now you hear this truth, and you think of the individual this morning that does not know Jesus. If it's not breaking your heart, if it's not calling you into a greater walk with God, please send me, send someone to open their heart, to open their eyes, to give them the gospel clearly. A famous comedian, magician guy, He's an atheist. And he says, how much do you have to hate someone if you truly believe there's a literal hell and people are going to it and you don't tell them? He's making fun of you because of your faith. He's saying there's a real hell, people are going to it, and you don't want to tell them? Well, you hate people more than I do. And it's funny, ha-ha, in the routine. But it's like a dagger in our hearts every time we look at someone and say, man, I really love you. I really care about you and, uh, you know... Hope the best for you. Instead of saying, do you know how to have a relationship with Christ? I want you to. I want you to know, and you would go at any point in your life and give up whatever needed to be given up to give that person the gospel because you love them. But I'm going to give you four ways this morning. I'm going to give you four ways that will guarantee that you will have the greatest tragedy. If you're taking notes this morning, it may not be for you. It may be for someone else. This might be exactly the next part in the relationship of your friendship and the communication that you have with an unsaved person. This might be exactly what you need to share with them. The first thing to, can, to guarantee that you will have the greatest tragedy is this. It's be self-righteous. Be self-righteous. Explain to me or to God or to anyone that you will get to heaven by anything that you do. That's self-righteousness. Declare yourself to be good. Declare yourself to be right by your standard and your way. I can declare myself right, but I have to submit to the authority of Scripture for how it all happened. I'm not right on my own. I was a sinner. I needed a Savior. 
I needed someone to take my sin and to cleanse me from it. I can't do it myself. Every one of us, every single person alive has to have Jesus as their Savior. Being self-righteous, here's the context, 822. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. So they're not thinking he's going to a town that they're not going to know about. They're starting to think, oh, he's, you're going to kill yourself? Like, think of the fitting comment, how that applies. It doesn't. It's a sarcastic rebuttal to truth. Being self-righteous is having or being characterized by a certainty, especially an unfounded one. Don't forget that part. An unfounded one that is totally correct or morally superior. When you think you're better than you actually are, that's self-righteousness. When you think you can declare yourself right before a holy God your way, that's self-righteousness. A self-righteous person is defined as one who is confident in his or her own righteousness. A self-righteous person also shows superiority above all others, especially if they have a different opinion than theirs. How are you saved today? By the grace of Jesus Christ. By him sending or giving and placing you in the right place at the right time that you heard the truth from either your parents, a co-worker, an evangelistic outreach. I am still to this day meeting people who have told me I came to Christ at a Billy Graham revival, okay? Now, there's some that are saying I came to Christ you listening to Billy Graham. That's great. But I'm saying there's people who were at various revivals throughout the United States. I've met them. That's how they came to know Christ. Why? Because one man said, I'm going to proclaim the gospel all over the globe. Now, I'm not challenging you this morning. Deliver the gospel all over the globe. I just want you to just start with the one simple thing. It's like riding a bike. Well, you got to go get the bike, right? Pull the bike out. Put the kickstand up. It's a pretty simple step. Get on the bicycle and go forward. And you say, oh, what about the hills? Don't go on the hills yet. What if the brakes don't work? You're going to go fast. What if the brakes do work and it's the wrong brake and you hit that brake and you flip over? Done it. I've done it literally, and I've done it in giving the gospel. You're going to turn the wrong way. You're going to turn too fast. You're going to go too fast on a dirt road. You're going to slide. You're going to fall. I've got a scar on my leg from going way too fast when I lived in Arizona. And that black top is good and great when it's got black top on it, but when it has sand on it and you try and turn in it, you splatter. And it hurt. But give the gospel. Explain the gospel. Deuteronomy 12.8. You shall not do at all what we're doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. God's people at various times had God directly say to them, you are doing what is right in your own eyes. You're wrong. You're sinning. You are my people. You don't live this way. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Unless you're here this morning and you would like to say, no, I haven't done that. I haven't sinned. I haven't done that. You're claiming your own righteousness. Scripture's clear. There's none righteous. And I think when Scripture uses an absolute, we don't get to challenge it. We don't get to argue with it. We say, uh-oh, that's all of us except one, and that's Christ. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. There's a lot of examples for how a person would be unclean. Leprosy could be one. There's many others. Here's what our righteous deeds are like. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, take us away. Think of the person who would bandage them up that has leprosy. It's a gooey, gross thing. And I'm not going to go into great detail because it made my stomach start to turn when I read it. 
I don't want to do that to you. I don't know how weak your stomach is. But the point is not to be like, let's see how gross we can be. But that's the reality. Our righteousness is that rag from that individual. You would take that rag off of that individual. It's soaked. It's gross. It's done. You don't say, here's a gift, right? None of us, ever. It's, use, it's done. It's nothing. No one wants it. And you would say, oh, well, you could wash it, hot water and bleach that, and it would be fine. Okay, that's gross. But by context, not back then, not back then. But then again, what does that say? looks like our own self-righteousness. We can clean ourselves up. Haven't you seen? Don't you know? We could bleach those rags. We could medically, there's a spray for that, and then we could reuse them. Leprous used cloths, right? Go down to Goodwill. Do you have that choice or anything else? What are you picking? Depends on the price, some of you would say. Well, yeah, you can't pass up a good deal. I mean, the leprosy is all gone now. Ooh, it stills the thought. It's like that for us. We're unclean. Righteous deeds, they're a filthy garment. So let's look a little bit closer at what they're saying here. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. So now they're saying, okay, he's, he's going to die, and he's going to go somewhere, because he's saying he's God, he's saying he's the Messiah, he's going to go somewhere. Their thoughts automatically are, we're going to heaven. We're keeping the law, we're doing the works, we're repenting, we're earning our salvation. That's what we're going. So he's clearly not going there. Where is he going? Okay? Jewish culture declares this, that if an individual takes their life, they go to hell. And this is a question that's come up quite regularly lately. See, they believed they were going to heaven because they were keeping the law, their own righteous deeds. They couldn't imagine that he was going there. He wasn't keeping their law. He wasn't doing it right, so he can't go to heaven because if he goes to heaven and they don't go to heaven, somebody's wrong, and they're declaring it's him. You're going to kill yourself? Ha ha. But the seriousness of it is this. The belief of most Jewish people is that it is something that you cannot do because it's a sin, and if you do it, it denies you the opportunity to repent of that sin. Now, it stems into more problems when we think that way. But I want to ask you this question this morning. If a Christian commits suicide, are they still saved? Whatever your answer is this morning, I want you to support it alone with Scripture. I'm going to explain to you why I believe what I believe from Scripture. You can disagree, but I believe what the Word of God declares is the truth that I will live by. It is not an easy thing to talk about. Because my friend, is gone, okay? Josh mentioned it. We both hung out with him. We were both around him. And I think, huh, what puts a person in that spot? I don't know. I don't understand. That's not my temptation. That's not my default. That's not my go-to. I don't think that way. I don't understand when a person does. But somebody this last week told me, and they're, they're older, they know in their life, people they know, more than 40 people that have taken their lives. I don't know how a person ends up in any situation like that. I don't. I can't give you that answer. I want to share with you what I believe happens to a believer if they were to take their own life. We're going to look at truths from Scripture. The first is John 3, 16. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a solid, simplistic truth. Whoever believes in him, okay? As I'm telling you, call on the name of Jesus. Whoever believes in him will not perish. A Christian, as far as we know by their profession and how we watch them walk, Okay? Sometimes they will walk in right relationship with God, and sometimes they will not. Right? Now, for you to sit here and go, oh, no, all Christians walk in right relationship with God. Do you really? 
Because you know you don't. You know there's times where you struggle. You know there's times where it's difficult. But you are born again. Anytime you step into any portion of a person's life and judge their whole life on specific events, you're judging an individual and you have no right to do that. You can ask questions and you can learn and you can understand and know, but when a person professes faith in Christ and we see fruit, and maybe sometimes we don't, so we're cautious. Oh, for a few months they haven't been showing fruit there. Not saved. Oh, no, that's not for us to declare. Repentance will come, okay? 1 John 5.13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Christians know they have eternal life because they find it in Scripture. They find it in Christ alone. We're talking about the Christian. We're talking about the Christian that's living. Okay? Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, or any other created thing. What will nothing be able to do? What will nothing be able to do? Based on the summary of this passage from Paul, the inspired word of God declared to us today, what can separate us from Christ? The answer is nothing. Well, suicide does because you murdered yourself, you killed yourself, and you didn't repent of that sin. Okay, if you believe that, you should be scared to death. Because if you leave here today, and you're driving, and somebody backs out that driveway, you know the one I'm talking about, they do it to me all the time. I don't know if they're planning it, I don't know who's calling them ahead of time, it seems to happen regularly. And I say, oh, you idiot. And oh, then I swerve. And I hit a tree and I roll my truck and it explodes magnificently like a movie. I'm gone. But I just hated someone. And Jesus says, if you hate your brother, if you hate someone, you've committed murder in your heart. Am I going to go to hell now because of my sin? No. Because I'm a believer in Christ. Should I hate people? No. Don't nod your head, though, but in a moment, the smirks of some of you, I know, I know, it happens. We don't live in it. We typically repent of it. We ask for forgiveness from it. But if we move on with our day and don't, it's not one of those sins that stays and now it's on us. Oops, I didn't repent of that one. Oh, cool, he got me. Like, what's the catchphrase? What's the thing we got to say to make sure? Uh, Is there an expression we can make that covers us all our sins? Well, yeah, in certain religious groups, there are but not in Scripture, because it's all taken care of. John 3, 18, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, the reality of the truths of Scripture are as if you're a believer, there is no condemnation coming to you. Now you would say, uh, but I would never kill myself, and Christians shouldn't kill themselves. I, I mean, I agree, you should not. But Christians shouldn't hit the wall when they get mad either. Christians shouldn't use curse words when they get mad either. Christians shouldn't sh- throw their tools when they get mad either, right? Christians shouldn't shout at their children. Christians shouldn't do a lot of things that they do, but because we're forgiven and we're not bound by that power of sin, we have new life. We have a new way to live. John 8, 44. It says, you are of your father, the devil. He's declaring this to the scribes and Pharisees. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. And every once in a while, he brings the lie along for us that's just right for us. It's just right for you, not me, for you. You add that to depression. You add that to anxiety. You add that to things that I do not know enough about to speak on. And you put a person in a moment of weakness just like you might be. I was telling people my fingernail had been broken for a really long time, and it was growing out, and it was really annoying. And finally, that one piece just kind of gave up. So now there's like this really sensitive piece on my finger because there's no fingernail. But I remember when it happened, and they were like, oh, Pastor, did you cuss? I was like, no, I didn't cuss. But what I did was I took the hammer, and I was like, oh. And I looked 
for a board that I was going to be replacing, and I hit it really hard, and it broke it because I was angry that I had been so stupid again to hurt myself. And you would say, Pastor, whoa. Right. Now, if I'm unstable in any way, shape, or form, emotionally, with a mental makeup, could a person, could we rightly understand that a person who won't talk to someone else, who hasn't reached out for help, would it be likely that their only alternative would be in that moment of despair and pain to say, I'm done, it's over, and they do it? It's a possibility. And it's a growing possibility. It is a concern. And some who I have known as uh, guest speakers uh, throughout college, I know of two who took their lives late in their ministries. No one knows why. But they battled, but they didn't talk. They were frustrated, and they didn't know where to turn to. Even as a pastor, and some of you have said this, I'm just as human as you are. I have a calling. I have a right walk with God required of me for my job qualifications. But if I get so frustrated that I think the only way out is to take my life, I have five people in this room that I know that I go to, and I say, this is how bad it is. And they will help me. They will turn to others with me. If they don't know what to do, they're going to find something. They're going to do something. And I want to tell you this. Do not take it lightly when a person begins to joke and begins to say or begins to act like there's nothing to live for. Don't just say, well, they're a Christian. They'll pull through. I mean, you get them, they'll read the Psalms. They'll be fine. They'll be good. Kind of. Kind of. Psalm 43, 5, I want it to be an encouragement to you. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Here's what David says. And why are you disturbed within me? That's going to happen to all of us. There's different phases in our lives. I think I'm coming into a midlife crisis, right? I think so. Now, you laugh, but don't, don't make me feel bad, right? I'm having a midlife crisis. I go play basketball, and I can't keep up. It makes me so angry. I'm like, run and jump and do it. And then my body's like, there you go. Like, that's all you got. And I'm like hurting for two days afterwards. It's a lot of fun. I love the fellowship. I love playing basketball. This young kid shows up, and I'm like, not another one. Like, oh, another young kid that's like super fast, and he's crazy. I didn't play last week. I had stomach issues. I'm like, oh, I can't play. I'm getting old. I got problems. I know I can't play now. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Why is my soul bothered? Why, why am I up at the end on that? And then I think of this. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. The help of my countenance. My outlook on life is helped directly because of God. Turn to God. Ask him to help you see the things of value. Ask him to help cleanse you of the sin. That might be the reason that you're so frustrated. David's saying, I'm going to turn to him. He's my help of my countenance, and he's my God. Because he's my God, I will not slow down. I will not give up. I will continue. I will go. But understand this, there are people with different makeups and dispositions and a lot of reasons. Like I said before, I don't understand them all. But you've got to get help if you need it. I want you to see this. If you're considering suicide, please get help. You talk to me. I will help you. If I don't know how to help you, I will do what I'm about to tell the rest of you to do, and it's this. Here's an 800 number that you call. I have a friend who's thinking of committing suicide. I have someone here with me right now who's deep in their thoughts of suicide. What do I do? There are professionals on the other end of that phone. If it's a direct emergency of their safety, you call 911 and you tell them. This person is trying to take their life. I have stopped them. I need help. They will send people to help. If you're struggling, there is no sin that we do not forgive. There is no thing in your life that you cannot be an overcomer in. Please hear me in that. Your church family will walk with you. Your church family will show you grace. Your church family will put their arms around you every time they need to. Because if we can't do it here, we will send them somewhere else. We'll get them the help they need if we're unable to do it. Because I'm telling you, there are things that cause people to think this way that we know we can't help with that. And if we don't send them to the right help, we're hurting that individual. Tell someone. Talk to someone about it. Get the help that you need. The National Hope Line Network and the National Suicide Prevention Line. Save them in your phone. I don't mean that for you, but maybe it is for you. Save it in your phone. 
have it ready. Oh, what's that number? Let me see. If you're in a situation with an individual who's possibly going to take their lives, do not say, hold on, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get some help. You don't have time. It's not an option. You stay with them. You come with me, let's go. Hold on, I'm going to call somebody. Be that person. To the people that you know that struggle with it, remind them. Remind them of that. Okay, there's instances throughout my ministry where the phone call was made. You listen to me, and that's what I said. You listen to me before you make any specific or difficult decisions. You call me first. You hear me? I don't care what time it is. You call me first. Do you understand me? And I'm, not, I'm saying it a little more aggressively than I did. You call me. And they're like, all right. All right, calm down. I'm not doing anything. I understand you're not, but you're not going to either until you call me first. I've never had to have someone call and say, okay, I'm done. They've never done it. But that's not me. That's you. That's different people. We have to look out for people. We have to look at this from the standpoint of what a sarcastic thing was said to Jesus. And I remember this as I was telling Jamie. She's like, you, you, you need to discuss this. You need to talk about this. A lot of people are asking this question of, of, of what happens to a Christian if they take their life. Don't they go to hell? Some people are saying, oh, I think they do. No, no. Scripture says they do not. Their sins are covered. All of our sins are covered. The past, the current, and the future sins are all covered in the blood of Christ. We know this. We take comfort in this. And I said, well, I just, I don't think I'm going to put a, like a whole sermon together for it. Like we, we're answering different people. You've asked, and I appreciate that. You asked, hey, I just got a question, and I sent res resources. My wife did the same thing. Others of you did the same thing. You're helping other people understand that. And I told Jamie that I was like, it was Tuesday. I called her, and I was like, okay, listen. <laughs> John 8, 22. They accused Jesus of wanting to kill himself. And I said, so I'm going to address it. Because I think possibly someone here or someone online needs exactly what I just said today. Just as much as you need the gospel, you may have needed that word of hope and open invitation. And I'm giving that open invitation on your behalf too. That you would be ready to talk on the phone or do whatever it took to help an individual choose life. Do that. Pray over that. It's a scary thing. Okay? But being self-righteous is the first thing that they're doing that guarantees them that they will experience the greatest tragedy. The second thing is to do this. It's be worldly. Be worldly. Now, it will be very specific how we explain be worldly. And he was saying to them, you are from below. He's saying, you're from here. I'm from above. Who is Jesus' father? To them, Joseph. Bible quiz. Joseph. Joseph's dad, carpenter. We know. I know, and some people, I know, they're, they're thinking, I know, some people said it was a miraculous birth. I get it. But other people were going, no, I really get it. Because I, didn't the prophet Isaiah say, and then they would quote it, and he would say, yes, that's true. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. He's talking about the world, the word cosmos. It refers to the invisible spiritual system of evil that opposes the kingdom of God. We see it all day. We see it all the time. We experience it for ourselves sometimes, and sometimes we've been so foolish that we've participated in loving the world. We are tempted to love the world. Satan knows exactly what you need or want, and he's laying it out there for you as a temptation. Take this, not that. What was the ultimate temptation as Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? One of them was, come down and set up your kingdom, set it up your way. Don't go to the cross. You don't need to go to the cross. You have all the power now. I'll even give you all of my kingdoms, and you can worship me a little bit too. Don't go to the cross. Oh, what would happen if you didn't? He would not be our Savior. And that's the same temptation we face. What do we want to do? What does God call you to do? What does God say do? What does the world tempt you with? Oh, no, man, that ain't, no, that's good. I don't need that. That'll be fine. I'm not going to do it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh... We do, not, we, not, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're going to believe the way he said believe. We're going to act the way he said act. We're not physically going to beat people when they don't do what they're supposed to, right? Like think through who's not here today, right? Who's got their baseball bat? Go get them, right? You miss church again. Don't hit him in the head, though, right? You hit him in the leg. Poof. All right, I'll 
I'll be back. Yeah, because we're warring against that flesh. We're physically going to help each other live better. Ooh. I mean, I think I would be like, well, I would like to leave that church, but it would probably go both ways. There'd be people waiting outside my door, too. Guess what you didn't do? Whack, and I'd get, oh, I'm going to hit you back. You hit me wrong. You didn't hit me in Jesus' name. We'd fight like crazy. It'd be horrible. But it's that very idea that God does not have your best interest in mind. God cannot save you. You're a sinner that's different from any other sinner. God will not allow you to have joy ever. And those are lies, and so many people believe in them. It is a world that is controlled by Satan. They do not recognize the true identity of Jesus. They are ignorant of the Holy Spirit. They are engulfed in all the world has to offer. And that specific crowd by culture will rejoice when he's hanging on the cross. Materialism, humanism, immorality, pride and selfishness, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life we see from 1 John 2.16, those are the trademarks of the individuals who live according to the world's system. You want to guarantee you're going to have the greatest tragedy? Continue to live for the things in this world. That is a guarantee for you. The world is completely opposed to divine truth, completely opposed to righteousness, completely opposed to virtue, completely opposed to holiness. Oh, actually, they're not. But every time I mention divine truth, righteousness, virtue, and holiness, just add the word self in front of it. The world is all for self-truth. Do you not hear that every day? Ken, what is your truth? Can you tell me your truth about whatever, any topic? It doesn't. You tell me your truth. I'll tell you my truth, and we'll probably just kind of function around each other until my truth offends your truth, and then your truth hurts my truth, and then we all have to find a new truth, and then someone else comes into the mix. Here comes Terry, and he says, here's my truth, and now we're like, wait a minute, there's three truths? Sure, by the world system all, all day. Listen, you never thought it would get this bad, but it is. Truth? Truth can't exist. I don't want to do that, but that's really loud. I'm sorry. The truth is really a confusing thing. Self-righteousness, self-virtue, self-holiness. I'm holy because I said so, not to a standard of someone else. The world's opinions are wrong. The world's aim is selfish. The world's pleasures are sinful. Its influences are demoralizing. Its politics are corrupt. Its honor is empty, its smiles are phony, and its love is false. But every once in a while, there's that, you just don't understand, Pastor. That's what I would want to say. Oh, God, you just don't understand. You just don't understand because that one, I, I was for sure that was good. It came from the world. It came from the father of lies. He laid it out for you. You bought into it. You were drawn away of your own lust. You were enticed. You were tricked. You did it wrong. But Jesus says, come to me who are heavy laden and whose burden is heavy. Come to me and I will give you rest. Stop pursuing the things of this world. It's a sure sign that you're headed for the greatest tragedy ever, the second death, if you love the world. Here's our options. You have two options. Stay on the path of your origination to its natural end. You're born of this world and you will die in your sins. It's exactly what Jesus is saying to them. Or you leave the world system and you become redeemed to eternal life. You now live differently. You live as one who portrays, pours out, hungers for the fruits of the Spirit. You, you wake up every day and you say, God, give me the fruits of your Spirit today. Use me to show the fruit of your Spirit, the unnatural ones that I don't want to show because my flesh wants to do it different. God, change me. And you read his word, and he gives you the words to speak. He gives you the comfort. He shows you the promise. He reminds you of the truth. He helps you. This leads to the third guarantee that you'll have the greatest tragedy. It's be unbelieving. Don't believe it. Well, that, well, that one seems pretty simple. Believe in the name of Christ. Call on his name. That's how you are given eternal life. Call on his name. If you don't, well, you're not a believer. You're an unbeliever. That's very simple. But I want you to hear what these religious, righteous people, self-righteous people, hear 
when he says it this way. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. Jesus has already made the declaration that he's the water turned to him. If you have thirst, he will cleanse you. And he came to them and said, in the darkness you've wandered, come to me. I am the light. They're seeing the pictures and the representations from the Feast of Tabernacles, and they're going, whoa, this makes so much sense. Object lessons galore. Amazing. Then, any scribe or Pharisee would know the Pentateuch. They would know the story of God's interaction with people. They would be reminded of another individual who was declared to say, I am. And it goes to Exodus chapter 3. God is preparing to send Moses into Egypt. And Moses says, how uh, am I going to do this? What am I supposed to say? Who do I tell them sent me? That's Moses' question. Listen to Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel. Who's the one saving us? Who's the one that's been called to come and get us out of Egypt? Who's doing that? I am has sent me to you. Moses would come and say, I am sent me to you. That's Jehovah. That's the name that's the holiest of all names. He's saying, God has sent me to declare these truths to you so that we can leave and be God's people and be free. And Jesus says the same thing to them. For unless you believe that I am he, Jesus just said, I am God. He has sent me to save you. If you don't believe that, you will die in your sins. There's no more clear call that God is Jesus, that Jesus is God, and he is the only way in salvation. The last way is to be willfully ignorant. It's one thing to not know because you didn't know, right? That's, I love that excuse, but I didn't know. I didn't know you weren't supposed to burn rubber cement in the garage underneath your dad's truck, right? Like, I didn't know that's a rule. I used to do that. I, I found in that uh, science experiment in uh, grade school, and I was like, oh, that's cool. So you could write a message with rubber cement and then light it on fire, and it would burn whatever you wrote, right? I thought that was cool. So I did it out in the garage. I was like drawing a big old picture, drawing all over the place. And oh, there's a truck. It's kind of in the way. I just kind of went under it a little bit and drew a bunch more and took that little lighter and lit it. I'm like, well, that's really cool. I think my dad came out and man, I didn't know I could fly. But for a moment I did. I flew right out of the garage and he threw dirt and crud all over it and put it out. And it was just like, like I knew he was past the point of even being able to talk to me at that point. He was like, <laughs> You could have, you know, when you get that mad, you're just like, what's that? You don't know what, ah! and you're just like, oh. And eventually it was like, you could have blown yourself up. You could have burnt the house down. What's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like, what's wrong with you? I, I mean, when you're little, you just don't know, okay? But that's not what we're talking about here. Willfully ignorant. Willfully choosing to be ignorant. Choosing to ignore what you're hearing this morning. You're hearing the gospel, and you're willfully saying, no, no. I don't need that. I don't want that. Or you're saying, no, maybe later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Maybe you have the time. Maybe you don't. But being willfully ignorant, John 8, 27, and 28, or 25 and 26. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? What's he been declaring the whole time? He hasn't changed his answer. He's been giving them the same answer. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the only one. I have many things to speak to and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world, to those that are lost, but to those that need salvation being willfully ignorant in verses 27 and 28, they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, he says it again, he. 
and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. He's not just a radical trying to make change and get Rome off everybody's back. He's the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. He is God with us. He came and he gives his life. He lays down his life. He declares it later. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. Who does he lay it down for? Every single sinner who will call on his name. That's who John 3.16 is talking about. And I pray that that's you this morning. I pray that you do have a greater confidence this morning that the second death is nothing for you to fear. The second death is nothing that you'll be a part of. But if you're sitting here with any of these four things, if you're being willfully ignorant, verses 29 and 30, he, he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That flies in their face because they're trying to do all the things that are pleasing to God. And they made their own rule book on how to do it. And they made really cool rule book appendixes in the back that make sure you know how to fix when you did not, right? Remember the lines around the Jewish parts of New York? If you ever go into that area, go into one of those neighborhoods and you'll see those lines out there because that's part of their property. That means they can go further on a Sabbath because it's kind of hard to live and not do things on the Sabbath if you need certain things on the Sabbath. So they've changed it a little bit to make it a little bit better, to make it a little bit easier to keep the laws. You weren't meant to keep the law. The law was the one that revealed to us we needed a Savior, and here's their Savior. And he's saying to them, all that I've done is always pleasing to him. That's got to make them so mad. There's no way you can please God because look at what you're doing. You're not doing it right. You, you're even claiming to be God. You can't be. But listen to verse 30. As he spoke these things. I'm sure I understand. Well, my phone needs the gospel. Holy cow. <laughs> well, what horrible timing was that, right? I don't think I understand. I'm like, am I not saying it clear enough? Holy cow. Uh, technology, right? Well, maybe that's you. You're saying, hey, I don't think I understand. That is different than being willfully ignorant. He's hearing it and saying, yeah, but no. No, thank you. As he spoke these things, and I want you to think about this, as someone preached to you, as your parents talked to you, as the evangelist spoke to you, as God used a faithful servant of him, many came to believe in him. Many came to believe in him. There's a lot of you here who you have come to Christ and you are walking in Christ. You are battling in Christ. You are secure in Christ. But there are some of you still here this morning. You're still hoping that your self-righteousness will mean something. You're still thinking there's a chance that you can do something about it, and there's not. You have heard the gospel this morning. If you are being willfully ignorant, it will guarantee you that you will have the greatest tragedy ever. You will live life separate from God. You will die in your sins. Jesus is being so clear. If you do not believe in me, you will die in your sins. Think of the millions and millions and millions of other people out there who have not called on the name of Christ. They are about to die in their sins. Who is your loved one that could die today, tomorrow, next month? They, without Christ, are dying. They will die in their sins. Will you please plead with God to change your heart? Will you plead with God to give you a boldness never heard or felt in your own life, that you in love and through holiness, you will take the gospel. You will write a letter if you need to write a letter. My sister was phenomenal at this. I believe my aunt is a believer today because my sister sent her letters while we were in college. She was overwhelmed, overwhelmed at my, I don't know if my aunt knows Jesus. I don't know if she knows. She kept sending her letters. And she said, I, eventually she said, you know what I do know? I know that Jesus is my Savior. I remember preaching her funeral and sharing the same story. But listen, there's funerals that I'll do for believers. They're difficult. It's painful. But there is a rejoicing that we hold on to because of his word, because of his declarations, because of his truth. When I do a funeral for a person who said, I didn't go to church, I didn't care for church, I don't care about Jesus, they never said anything about it, they never lived like there was a God, they didn't really care, all they can do is fill me with all the good things they've done in their lives. That's their hope. They're in a better place because they did 
they liked, they were good. But that's not the truths of Scripture this morning. That's not it. Jesus is so clear this morning. There is a tragedy coming, and it will be great. There will be millions. We have an obligation. We send missionaries, good. We go to our missionaries, we help them, good. We bring them here and we help them, great. Who has God put on your heart right now that needs to hear the gospel and they need to hear it clearly? They need to hear it from you. You can tell me, I'll go talk to them, I'll give them the gospel. But they need to hear it from you. Be bold. Let's stand together and pray and we'll sing our final song together. Lord, as we stand here this afternoon, many of us do so because we are born again. We know you. We've called on your name. We've heard from Scripture. You've opened our heart. You've opened our eyes. We believe. We are believers. We're pursuing your word. God, we are not perfect. And there's times when we blow it, we know it. But God, your grace is wonderful. Your grace covers a multitude of sins. You heal the damages we cause to ourselves and to others. Help us extend the grace that we've received. But God, break our hearts when we think that we're better than others and we won't share the gospel with them. Help us because of the fear of what we think might happen. Because according to your word, the worst thing will happen if we don't say anything. Give us that boldness. Help us utilize the Holy Spirit in the convicting process, but also in the enlightening and the knowledgeable part that we can know your word. We can know you, and you have tasked us with going and sharing and saying that to others. Would you call many, many more into your family through every person that hears this message? Whether they come to this church, whether they come to any other gospel-believing church, God, that's our desire. We want them to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.